A year ago, the Atlanta Braves won 101 games and claimed a fifth straight division title, and yet there's myriad reasons to believe they could be even better this year. Welcome to 2023 season and welcome into another BP TV. I'm Corey McCartney. He's Grant McCauley and Grant. Suffice to say, all the pieces are in place for the Braves to add to this NLE streak. Yeah, it feels like they are. I mean, every club's going to have its own stories, its own injury issues, and you know, all the things that are going to come with the 162 and some of them that even show up in spring training. But I do feel like the Braves are poised to do exactly what they've done the last five seasons, win the National League East, but it will be a battle. And we know that the Mets and the Phillies both spent an awful lot of money to make it so here in 2023. And we're about to find out how crazy this ride might be. So let's dig into the offense first. And the potential firepower is scary with this lineup. Remember, they led the National League in homers a year ago and were seventh overall in F4, fourth in the NL. And that came with health leading to two all-stars having the worst seasons of their career. Right. I mean, you had Ozzy Albies, Ronald Acuna Jr., and Eddie Rosario hitting 28 combined home runs a year ago. I don't see any way that's going to happen in 2023 unless you're dealing with the same kind of injury issues and knock on wood. You hope you're not going to have to. Eddie Rosario has looked resurgent this spring. I think Ronald Acuna Jr. has been flashing the power that people want to see, at least late in the spring training slate. He seemed to look like that. And Ozzy Albies has looked like he's got that power stroke back if his spring training results are any indicator, and he looks to be healthy as well and ready to resume everyday second base duties. So you put those guys back in at maximum strength, and you add in the fact that, gosh, I don't know if anybody's been watching Matt Olson this spring, but he seems like he might have a pretty good year. Austin Riley has been flirting with 40 home runs, and then you've got Michael Harris, a potential 20 to 30 home run threat, maybe a 2020 player this year. He was almost one last year. The Braves have more firepower at catcher. We'll see what they get out of left field, see what they get out of DH. We'll see what they get out of shortstop. But overall, Corey, I think this is a club that could hit 250 or more home runs this year, and I don't think it would be a stretch to say that. Yeah, Acuna and Albies, to me, I mean, think about it a year ago. Just to, to recap here, Acuna hit 14% above league average, which is solid, but not the 145 WRC plus that he had averaged in his previous four seasons. And then yeah. Albies hit below league average for the first time in his career in those mere 64 games. Obviously, they're healthy and looking to bounce back. You mentioned Rosario after uh, sitting 39% below league average of the plate a year ago. And also, I know we don't, obviously Marcelo Zuna, whose role within this organization has seemed tenuous uh, at best since his 2020 tear. He's had a really solid spring, an OPS north of, four, of uh, 850. I'm really interested to see interested to see with Michael Harris a second. What does he do for an encore after that rookie of the year campaign? He's projected via zips to have a 2020 season, uh, be a nearly five war player. You come up with, you know, five, maybe six guys in this lineup that could hit 30 plus home runs. And then there's the arrival, as you mentioned, of Sean Murphy at catcher. The question mark, obviously, Grant, with this group is clear. And this is shortstop where Orlando Arcia gives him the nod over uh, Vaughn Grissom and Braden Shoemake, who made a push this spring. This has been a top five uh, team in shortstop F4 two of the past three seasons. Uh, I think that that's something that's not probably not going to happen in the 2023 season. But nonetheless, this is without question one of the deepest lineups in baseball. And I think we're going to have them uh, in the very short conversation for the best uh, offenses in the game in 2023 season. I agree. If you're asking me to rate the Braves like position groups and what their clear strength is, I mean, the strength is offense on this club, and that's to take nothing away from what could be a very capable starting rotation and was last year and what could be the best bullpen in all of baseball as well. I mean, that's something that you don't really expect to hear too many people talking about, well, they've got the best of this and the best of this and the best of this, and you add it all together and you come up 101 win season and you've got eyes on doing it again. By the way, you just won a World Series year before last and you've won the division five straight years. I mean, the Braves expect to be good. And the reasons that they can expect, I think, to be good in 2023 is exactly what you were talking about, the depth of this club. I know Orlando Arcia is not Dansby Swanson. Nobody needs me to tell you that. I think everybody knows that this is something that, you know, it, they may reassess it at some point, but they have the depth behind them to do so because they did see something from Braden Shoemake this year. They got them excited in spring training enough to say, hey, we can put him down in Gwinnett, try to get that bat a little bit of work, get him some at-bats, get him comfortable again. Then if we need to call on him, we bring him up. And that's to say nothing of Vaughn Grissom, who does appear to be, and I still think is, a big part of the future of this club. But I know Alex Anthopoulos has talked about the quality of Orlando Arcia that the Braves have versus the player that he was when he was with the Brewers. He showed it in spurts last year, playing at second base for the Braves with Ozzie Albies down. He has some power. He may be able to give some things offensively to this club that will be perfectly acceptable for a ninth hitter in the lineup. 
And if he can just go out and play a capable shortstop and just make the plays, basically, doesn't have to really rate out at the level that Dansby Swanson has the past couple of seasons. But I think that, you know, there's not really that much that would separate Orlando Arcia as he is right now and Vaughn Grissom as he would be over the course of the full season. And I think that's what it came down to for the Braves. All respect to Brayden Shoemake as well. I think he is a factor in all of this and could be before the year's over. I just think they wanted to go with a guy that had a little bit more experience because it allowed them to get some important experience to a guy in Vaughn Grissom who really wouldn't have been up last year if Brayden Shoemake hadn't been hurt. Well, I'm going to play spoiler here. Uh, Orlando Arce is not going to start 162 games uh, at the shortstop position, so we're going to see some of those other guys as well. And you kind of transitioned to it, so let's move on to the arms. Uh, the Braves were seventh in rotation F4 last season, ninth in ERA. They obviously bring back the NL Cy Young runner-up and Max Fried, who will get the ball on opening day. MLB's only 20-game winner a year ago and Kyle Wright, rookie of the year runner-up Spencer Strider, and veteran Charlie Morton, who has the seventh most strikeouts among all starters when you combine the past two seasons. Whether the brunt of the starts of the of the fifth guy in the mix go to Jared Schuster, Dylan Dodd, or maybe a more familiar face like Ian Anderson, uh, Mike Soroka, or even Bryce Elder, I'm going to go out on a limb here and be a little bold, Grant. The Braves have not finished in the top five in rotation F4 since 2009. I'm calling it that is absolutely ending in 2023. I think that would be a pretty good prediction, I believe. And you may have the number right there in front of you as far as F4 for the rotation last year. It was about 15, which is pretty good. It would put you into the top 10 again and, and maybe even into that top five, depending on how things play out across all of baseball. And to be honest, it really wasn't that far away. You know, maybe what, a, and I guess a, a, a win in F4 is a big deal. But when you spread it out upon, you know, five, six, seven, or 11 starters, the Braves utilized last year, maybe it's not as much separating the top you know, five or six teams, as you might imagine. But to put all that semantics aside, I do think, and I do agree with you, that the Braves rotation will be a strength because you have somebody like Max Fried who could go out and compete for a Cy Young. And we just found out that Spencer Strider, as of what he showed last year, might be in that conversation as well because he was striking out batters at a historic pace last year. Yet the only 20-game winner in baseball, Kyle Wright, he slowed here at the start of the year, but they hope to have him back in the month of April sooner than later, as I like to say. And your fourth starter is Charlie Morton. I know there are some questions about the Braves bringing him back. And essentially they did a fancy way of exercising his option and giving him one more. And basically they kept Charlie Morton on retainer. If your fourth starter is somebody that can give you 175 or 180 innings of just, you know, I think quality enough pitching, if he can get his home run rate back down, it's going to be better than just quality. It's going to be above average. And that's what Charlie Morton has been really since about 2016 or 2017. He's going to strike out 200 batters. That's a pretty good fourth starter. Then you can kind of figure this thing out at five, whether it's Jared Schuster or Dylan Dodd getting a whole bunch of starts this year or just kind of playing a role here and there. Or is Ian Anderson going to be able to reclaim a spot in rotation after being a huge part of the Braves postseason runs in 2021 uh, and 2020, his rookie year when he didn't have that much experience but kind of exploded on the scene? And speaking of 2020, can we get Michael Soroka back on the mound for the first time in a big league ballpark since August of that year. I mean, he is pushing nearly three years away at this point, and I know nobody wants it worse than Michael Soroka. He's going to get his work in at AAA Gwinnett. If he does well, Corey, can you keep him out of the rotation in the month of April? I really just don't know how. I don't know when I'm going to get used to this whole Mike Michael Soroka thing, but maybe <laughs> right. at some point in 2023, he's going to get so many starts, I'm going to have no choice but to continue right. to call him Michael. Uh, with the bullpen, uh, there's a new face at closer with Kenley Jansen now in Boston, but that player, Rossi Iglesias, will start the season on the injured list with a sore right shoulder. This group, though, is so deep. I mean, A.J. Mentor was top five in F4 among all relievers last year. Atlanta had four in the top 25 in the NL when you take Mentor, Colin McHugh, Dylan Lee, and Jesse Chavez. Obviously, the arrival of Joe Jimenez, who was 15th in the AL in F4, only figures to make this relief corp even better. Grant, they were very good a year ago. Again, I, mean, I feel like this is a, a broken record here. They have a chance to be very, very good in this area as well. And they brought in a capable lefty like Lucas Litke that they can use kind of in the middle innings if they need to utilize that. Dylan Lee had an outstanding spring, if anybody's been keeping up with that. I don't think he allowed a run in eight and two-thirds innings, if I'm correct, with 14 punch-outs, and I'm not sure he walked anybody either. This was a really great spring for Dylan Lee. If you just needed a reminder of how useful he could be, you know, he was another rookie that came in last year and helped stabilize that bullpen in an important middle-inning role. Maybe he gets a little more responsibility this year. Maybe you've got Kirby Yates back to the pre-2022 yeah. form. I don't know if he'll be the 2019 guy that was one of the best closers in baseball, 
but he's certainly somebody that can pitch in high leverage, knows how to do it. And you want to have Rice Iglesias back sooner than later. The club downplayed the seriousness of his you know, shoulder issue, his inflammation. Again, much like I think Kyle Wright, you just don't want to push it in the first couple of weeks and compound a small thing and turn it into something bigger. So I'm, I'm pretty, I, I think, pleased with the way that the depth of the both the rotation and the bullpen will play out. But you do want to see those guys slotted in because A.J. Minter was the Braves' most valuable reliever last year. One of the big reasons why, Corey, and we've seen this the last few seasons with A.J., you can utilize him in the sixth inning or the seventh inning or the eighth inning. And, of course, he can throw the ninth. But he's kind of been the Swiss Army knife of, hey, you've got three tough hitters coming up that you need some outs and you need somebody to mow them down. A.J. Minter's been getting that call a lot, and he has answered that call. And no, no better example of that than 2022. Yeah, and remember, no Tyler Matzik this year after undergoing right. Tommy John surgery, so it's going to be that much more important for Minter to hold down that role in 2023. We know so much focus of the 23 season, especially early on, is going to be on the rule changes, of course, the pitch timer, restrictions on defensive shift, larger bases. So instead of asking your uh, overarching feelings on the pace of play and all that's going to this is potentially going to lead to, tell me the Brave that is the player you're most intrigued with how these new rules are going to impact, and let's start with the pitch clock. Well, the pitch clock, I think, is just going to be an overall group, like getting used to it from the pitcher side. I think hitters might have more of the weird run-ins with umpires over it than I think pitchers are going to have. But as I've talked to a lot of people that have dealt with this in the minor leagues, it's a bumpy start, and it was in the spring some. But then after about a month or six weeks, you kind of start to get used to it, and it's going to normalize. So I don't know if I'm looking at the pitch clock as that big of a detriment, but I will say this. We were not really seeing spring training games where the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings matter because nobody really cares who wins these games. You're just getting reps. You're getting experience. You're getting a look at players. Everybody's just trying to be healthy. You're not playing extra innings. What's that pitch clock going to look like when you got those high leverage spots where you're bringing in relievers with the bases loaded? Can you really call a ball here or call a strike on this hitter because he was looking down to third base to try to make sure he got the sign right? I'm just interested to see once we start to put everything in the game at a higher leverage, what the pitch clock is going to look like. And it could look the same as it has just faster. That may be the answer to it. I don't really know, but I, I just don't know that any one in particular jumps off the page that it's going to be a difficulty for them. Uh, we knew Kenley Jansen was going to have to deal with the pitch clock about as much or more than anybody, but that's something for the Boston Red Sox to figure out with Kenley. The Braves don't really have to worry about it. And I don't really see too many other pitchers or really any other hitters that wastes that much time, but you'd like to just know that you can take a breath, let the game breathe and kind of control that pace. And I'm just waiting along with everybody else to see what that looks like when the lights are on bright, there's 40,000 screaming fans and every pitch matters. Well, you talked about ump show before. We know that was a trending topic. Wait until those games matter and we get to those late situations. Yeah. That's going to become a trending topic for sure. But I will say I do have two guys, and I think everyone's going to adjust, but only 18 qualified pitchers took longer than A.J. Minter did with bases empty and with and only eight with runners on a year ago. Meanwhile, every brave starter was over the now enforced 15 seconds with bases empty and 20 with a man on in 2022. Uh, but Max Freed was the biggest culprit, a whopping 26.2 seconds on average with men on. Uh, obviously I think they're all going to adjust and I think everyone's going to get used to this new pace of play, but I'm interested to see those two in particular to see how this impacts them. Now about the shift, uh, I think we're probably leaning the same way and who we think could be the biggest beneficiary there. Yeah. I think the answer is Matt Olson. And I know a lot of ink has been spilled about this already. And I know Matt Olson himself has said, look, it'll be cool to see some grounders get through the right side, but if I'm hitting the ball on the ground, I haven't really done what my objective was to go to the plate anyway. So Fair. he'll take the hits most certainly. And if you look at what Matt Olson has done this spring, I mean, he's picked up hits, he's picked up homers, he's taken his walks. I mean, he looks about as polished as you could possibly imagine. I know he was hot for three weeks to start the year last year, and that was very, very exciting. He looks like a totally different animal. And I know it's spring training. I, I get it. I, I get it. Nobody has to tell me. But when you tear through Grapefruit League play the way that Matt Olson did, Slight adjustment in the stance I thought was interesting. The bat's no longer leaning forward as he gets ready. It's already leaning back towards his shoulders. So maybe that's just a little thing that becomes a big thing for him. Because remember in 2018, when Ronald Acuna Jr. all of a sudden changed where he put his hands and the kind of tear that he went on? Maybe that's just one of the little things that is a huge thing for Matt Olson, just unlocking what was already there, what we've seen some of in Oakland, but very much want to see in Atlanta. And that is a monster season.
Well, a little birdie told me there was a weight distribution issue in Matt Olson's swing that he okay. did address this winter. So just going to throw that out there. But I think it's right. I mean, it has to be Matt Olson, right? I mean, only Freddie Freeman had more at bats against the shift last year than Olson's 800. He had 23% below league average in those ABs. So obviously, as you mentioned, the spring results were very good. Eight homers and over 1,500 OPS. Probably not sustainable, but man, he's going to love his new existence. Finally, onto the bigger bases. I think you could go a number of ways with somebody you want to put the focus on here. Yeah, I'm going Ronald Acuna Jr. I think that this is a year that, yeah, he could steal 40 bases. He hasn't done it yet. He was close in 2019. He stole 29 bags in less than 120 games a year ago. I think Ronald's going to steal 50 bases this year. That's my that's one of my bold predictions. Let's go ahead and throw that one out there. And you were there at FanFest. I asked him about it. Okay. Stolen base is a big part of your game. Do you think that the limited pickoffs and also the bigger bases is something that's going to lead you to steal more? He did say, you know, with a smile, I got to get on first, but if I'm on base, I always think about stealing. So I think he's going to be thinking about it a lot this year, and I think he's going to steal upwards of at least 40. I'm thinking 50 steals for Ronald this year. Yeah, I mean, you think about him, Harris as well. I mean, they've got guys who have the potential to go well beyond uh, 30 plus steals, and uh, all these could get back to that 20 steal range as well. But I think Sean Murphy, look, they brought him in. He had the gold sure. glove and MLB's second best pop time to get even better defensively because of what his tools meant in this new era. Uh, I want there to be the good, the bad, and the ugly whistle playing at Truist Park when Murphy throws out a runner because I firmly expect him to be laying down the law behind the plate. Yeah, I, I think that there's no two ways about what was the number one thing the Braves looked at with Sean Murphy in being enticed to take what was a good catching situation in 2022 and hopefully make it a better one for the next decade after you consider the uh, the extension that they handed to Sean Murphy as well. And hearing a little bit from Sean just at FanFest and also a little bit in spring training and some of the interviews and things I've been reading throughout the course of the spring, he's excited to see this aspect of the game come back in the stolen base and maybe more stolen base attempts because he loves showing off that arm. And as you mentioned that pop time, I got a chance to watch him go through some catcher's drills. I've seen him throw some this spring in games. It's been an awful lot of fun. And that is something I love about the game too, is I think teams got very risk averse to stealing bases. They didn't want to get thrown out. They didn't want to take the same kind of chances. Maybe we used to see back in the eighties or nineties. Maybe this is something that's going to come back into the game. And I think that's nothing but fun. The Vegas over under has the Braves at 95 and a half wins tied for the Astros and Dodgers to the MLB uh, lead. Obviously they have not won back-to-back 100 win seasons since 2002, 2003, the path to doing that, it begins in Washington. So don't forget, we've got you covered all season long here on BPTV to so subscribe, turn on notifications and tell a friend until next time. I'm Corey McCartney. He's Graham McCauley and we'll see you soon. Braves country.